if you look at postmodernist approaches to science, I think they actually have two roots. One is the sort of strong program in, in the sociology of science that Barnes and Bloor initiated at Edinburgh. They were responding to a situation which I think they accurately described, in which they said that the characteristic way in which sociologists and historians of science often think about science is that when scientists get things right, that's because they use the scientific method. And when they get things wrong, that's because some um, social factors intervened. And they pointed out that this is really naive. Of course, all the social structures of scientific inference are socially mediated. They proposed what they called the symmetry principle, according to which true and false scientific findings should be explained using exactly the same resources. And they took that, and almost everybody took that, to mean that the notions of truth and falsity shouldn't play a role in the social explanation of scientific theorizing. There's an alternative view that I favor, according to which you could honor the symmetry principle without abandoning the notion of truth or falsity. You just have to think that when scientists systematically get it right, there's a complicated social explanation in which the notion of truth can play a role. And when they get it wrong, there's an equally complex social explanation in which notions of truth and falsity can get it wrong. And I think the other source of this postmodernist view comes mainly out of feminist theory with a, with a history in Marxist theory, namely a concern for social ideology in science. Imperialist policies were justified by scientific discoveries that colonized non-white people were inferior. The difference in, in income and status between men and women was uh, defended by allegedly scientific discoveries about fundamental and essential differences between the sexes. And I think many scholars found it attractive to say that the key tool they should have is to criticize the very notion of objectivity or truth. That's not a view I agree with, but I think the motives for it were quite admirable, actually. Well, let's focus in on a few of these notions that you've just alluded to. Let's start with objectivity. What do we mean by objectivity, and why should we be in favor of it? (laughs) Well, I actually think the notion that people have of objectivity, that all of us have, is a kind of mixture of the idea of systematically getting at the truth. So if you ask about a uh, research strategy whether it's objective, if you understand that question to be the question of whether doing research in that way is pretty likely often enough to get somewhere near the truth, that seems to be a very important property that a research strategy might have. I think that what confuses people is that we have a culturally transmitted conception of what underwrites objectivity in that sense. And what our culture teaches us is that you're doing things objectively if you aren't prejudiced. And what does it mean not to be prejudiced? It means not to have any presuppositions. And that means to study each question on its own merits with no presuppositions. And it turns out that nobody does that in science. And so if you notice that nobody does that in science, you might think, ah, we discovered that there's no objectivity. But in fact, What seems to be the case in the sciences that work well and in daily life is that the real rule is not the rule, don't have any presuppositions. The rule you want to follow if you can is to have approximately true presuppositions. And very often in many mature sciences where there's no money betting on one side or the other or no political project in the way, the presuppositions that people have in, say, elementary chemistry are pretty accurate. And so having those presuppositions allows you to design experiments to find out new stuff. So I think what there is is a tension between the ideal of objectivity understood as the ideal of getting closer to the truth in a systematic way, and this model of how objectivity is obtained, according to which it's obtained by not having presuppositions, that can't be right. But I think many people who are moved by postmodernism associate objectivity with freedom from presupposition, and then by doing historical or sociological work, they can demonstrate that there isn't research that's even remotely free from presupposition, and they're then led to deny the notion of objectivity altogether. Let's look at some of the other concepts that you're working with. One is that of the natural kind. What is a natural kind? Well, for a very long time, and Mill is the person who sort of introduced, reintroduced this term. This is uh, John Stuart Mill in John Stuart 19th Mill, right, century. That Mill. Yeah. Right. People have noticed for a long time that if you are trying to explain something or you're trying to make generalizations, it helps to have a somehow appropriate vocabulary. So, for example, if I'm trying to figure out chemical reactions and I sort reagents by what color they are, I'm not going to be able to see very many interesting patterns because there are lots of chemically very different white substances and red substances and so forth. So the, the notion of a natural kind got introduced by Mill, reintroducing some older ideas, as a kind of thing that was a locus of important generalizations or explanations.
relations. And what's characteristic, I think, of our use of natural kind concepts is that because we know that our task is to carve things up in a way that's useful for induction or explanation, we treat our taxonomies as revisable. So for a long time, acids were detected mainly by having an acrid smell and uh, being able to etch metals and things like that. But once it became clear that what those reagents had in common that explained the properties people had already noticed was that they were proton donors, the notion of an acid was fruitfully expanded because uh, when you think of acids as proton donors, you have a taxonomy that helps you see more about how chemical mechanisms work. So it's characteristic of natural kind concepts that appropriate method allows us to revise and and reconceptualize our standards of application. You talked about natural kinds in terms of the way in which we carve up the world. What is the difference here between the realist and the relativist? Is it that the relativist is going to put more emphasis on the carving up part of the process of arriving at a natural kind, and he's not going to think of a natural kind as natural but as the product of our concepts. What we're doing when we talk about natural kinds is we're talking about ways people sort stuff that turns out to be fruitful or not fruitful. I think the real contrast to the notion of natural kind is the notion of a nominal kind, the idea of a kind that's defined by whatever criteria we happen to choose. So if I you know, have a kind that consists of, of all things that are either pencils or glasses of water, that's an arbitrary kind. There are not going to be any interesting explanatory uh, laws or inductive generalizations about those things, whereas if I have either acids or late capitalist economies or flightless birds, those are all going to be loci of interesting properties that figure in explanation and induction. But I think the notion of uh, a natural kind has been assimilated by postmodernists to the idea of kinds defined by unchanging essences. So if you think of races as being kinds because you think you have to appeal to notions of race in order to do social explanation, the worry is that you would have to think that races were characterized by eternal and unchanging properties. I just think that's a mistaken conception of uh, how you should understand kinds. I mean, they're... uh, You can't explain social stratification and racism without appealing to social categories like Negro or or whatever, but that doesn't mean that you're committed to there being any eternal essence of negritude. I think that's a point that hasn't been adequately emphasized in the disputes between postmodernists and scientific realists. In what you say about the postmodernists, you seem to be suggesting that they're guilty of what I would think of as the skeptic or the skeptic's strategy. The skeptic sets the standards for knowledge very, very high, points out that these high standards for knowledge cannot possibly be met by any claims we want to make in the world, and therefore falls back on complete skepticism, says we can know nothing. Now, you seem to be suggesting that the postmodernists are doing something rather similar. They are assuming that, say, natural kinds have to be natural. That's what we mean by them. They have to be eternal and part of the world. Lo and behold, they're not. So that's one up to the postmodernists. Well, I think that you're right in thinking that the strategy is a skeptical strategy. But I think that very often when people deploy skeptical strategies of that sort or or of other sorts, they're doing that in service of some project, and you can independently evaluate the project. And so insofar as postmodernists are interested in being able to illuminate the way in which conceptions of race or gender or human nature have figured pathologically in the way science has functioned ideologically, I think their project is admirable. And in fact, part of the reason I haven't been talking about postmodernists as unfavorably as I might have is I think that very often the actual scholarship done by people in science studies or in gender studies, for example, or or in in the States and African-American studies, these are disciplines where sometimes postmodernist slogans loom large, but often their empirical research is extremely good and uncovers exactly the sort of interesting ideological facts that, as a matter of fact, most analytic philosophers of science 
don't know about. I mean, we, we're not professional historians or sociologists, but it's true that if you are part of this postmodernist project, when you're doing empirical studies, you're likely to be sensitive to some really important causal variables. Now, it's true that your official view may say that there's no such thing as causation and there's no such thing as good work or something, but I wouldn't want to demean the empirical accomplishments which many of these people have achieved in their empirical work. I agree with you that there's a kind of skeptical approach that raises the standards very, very high and then says nothing meets it and then reaches a skeptical conclusion. But I think it's important to see that as part of a broader research program that is often actually quite fruitful in other respects. What about the process of empirical testing? Again, do you want to put some emphasis on the degree to which the empirical testing of theories might be informed by conceptual structures, cultural practices, and so on? Sure. And in fact, I think that one way of seeing why a reasonable notion of objectivity isn't the notion of proceeding without presuppositions is this. Suppose I have a scientific theory that I especially like and I want to test predictions from it. There are going to be an indefinite number of predictions that that theory might allow me to make. If I want to test my theory rigorously, in particular if I want to persuade others to to agree with me, I can't choose experiments at random. What I have to do is I have to ask myself, what are the reasonable alternatives to my theory? What other theories addressing the same subject matter should people take seriously? And then can I find experiments or field observations or whatever, depending on what the theory is, that will discriminate between the truth of my theory and the truth of these reasonable alternatives? And I think this is popper. You should try to falsify theories. Okay, How do you try to falsify a theory? Well, you try to figure out what sorts of experiments would be most likely to show that it's mistaken if it's mistaken. How do you do that? You ask yourself, from a scientifically informed point of view, which theories among the infinitely many ones that a logician could dream up, which ones are the ones that are serious rivals to the theory that's been proposed, which ones are the ones that are most like, one of which is most likely to be true if the theory isn't true, and then you test the theory rigorously by pitting it experimentally against those rivals. So objectivity in the sense of rigorous theory testing actually requires that one deploy one's culturally transmitted scientific background knowledge to identify relevant alternatives. This is relevant to issues about ideology in science that we were discussing earlier because, of course, if you are in the unfortunate position of operating in a cultural tradition where, say, conceptions of race are so profoundly wrong that your understanding is deeply limited, then you could test a racist hypothesis against all the alternatives alternatives plausible in your cultural scheme, and you might never get anywhere near the truth. That's why there's a kind of radical contingency in the reliability of scientific methods. If uh, an answer somewhere near the truth isn't among the things that are even remotely plausible at a time, scientific research isn't very likely at all to uncover the truth. Just finally, where do we find ourselves if we go to a higher level of abstraction? The great 20th century American philosopher Quine said that philosophy was continuous with the empirical sciences. So it wasn't as though philosophy was above physics, legislating for physics, telling physics how to go about its business. There was in fact no dividing line between the two. Where do you stand on this? Well, that's a view called philosophical naturalism. I think that part of what put philosophical naturalism at a disadvantage in dialogue with postmodernism is that Quine's own conception was, I'm being crude, but to a good first approximation, it looked as though he thought that epistemology should be turned over to perceptual and cognitive psychologists and that metaphysics should be turned over to physicists so that the range of empirical sciences with which philosophy was continuous might just be physics and perceptual psychology. I think philosophy is continuous with other kinds of empirical inquiry, including you know, not only physics and perceptual psychology, but the sociology of science and the social history of racial exploitation and the social history of biology. So I, I think that the way in which we should view philosophy as a kind of empirical science is that it has special sorts of methodological concerns, special sorts of concerns about rationally reconstructing how people are thinking, but it's broadly an empirical discipline. But the other empirical disciplines to which it's closely related are quite diverse. And I think that, I guess if you had asked Quine, he might have agreed in principle, but I don't think that was what most people took as their take-home lesson from Quine. Well, on that happy notion of diversity, we're going to have to close. Professor Richard Boyd, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.